Are we rolling? Hey, what's going on guys? Today we're gonna dive headfirst into the Temple of the Jade Serpent to break down the routing, important mob mechanics, and the general boss fights. Once again, feel free to use the YouTube timeline down below to navigate to any part of the video you'd like. If you find this video useful, hit that subscribe button. I'd also like to mention that this route and other dungeon routes are located in my Discord server. That link will be in the description. Let's not waste any time though and dive right in. While this dungeon does appear to have choice in which boss you can go to first, it'll be much more efficient for your group to start by heading towards Wise Mari. This boss is located to the left or north end of the dungeon. Also, at the time of recording this, the dungeon percentage count in Mythic Dungeon Tools add-on is completely off. I'm sure this will be fixed soon, but for the time being, if you're using the add-on and you can't find a way to hit 100%, don't worry, it's very easy to hit all your count in this dungeon just by holding W. I do also want to mention that the route on Keystone Guru is up to date, so you can always check there. Lastly, this timer will appear super forgiving until you wipe. If you play it safe, this dungeon is actually pretty timeable. Alright, with that out of the way, let's begin. The first mobs you're going to run into in this instance are the Fallen Water Speakers and the Corrupt Droplets. The Droplets are non-elite mobs that will deal consistent damage to your group, but really shouldn't be anything to worry about unless you're pulling multiple packs together. The Fallen Water Speakers have two casts. First, they'll cast Hydro Lance, which is just going to deal frost damage to a party member, most likely your tank. Just kick this whenever possible. But you'll definitely want to save an interrupt for the Tidal Burst cast. This will hit your group with a massive burst of damage that can be lethal when paired with other mechanics within the pool. Lastly, you'll find Corrupt Living Water, and those are the elemental type mobs. These guys, for the most part, are a healer check than anything. They will cast Surging Deluge, which is an avoidable ground effect. Do your best to avoid this, but the major HPS check is going to come from their Tainted Ripple cast. This will apply a pretty nasty dot to your group. You can actually line of sight this if you're paying attention, so try to do that if you can. This fight can be extremely misleading for how simple it is because the most dangerous mechanic is actually really difficult to notice. Wise Mari cannot be moved from the center, so I recommend everyone just being on this inner ring. Trust me, it'll help out later. I'm looking at you, priests. This boss, similar to Medivh and Karazhan, will not auto-attack, or at least it's very unlikely, but instead he's going to spam Hydro Lance at random players. What this means is you'll ideally want to have a set interrupt rotation. Since it's magic, it can be immune by abilities like Cloak of Shadows or Spell Reflect by Warriors. He will periodically apply Corrupted Vortex to a random player as well. This player needs to be sure to be anywhere but the center of the ring. After it expires or it's removed, it will leave a Vortex on the ground that will slowly try to pull players into the center of them. This can be devastating if you're caught in it during Wise Mari's Wash Away cast. So lastly, Wise Mari will cast Wash Away, which is a super hard to notice frontal channel that will target a random player, and then it'll rotate around the room 360 degrees. The closer you are to the boss, the less movement that's going to be required from you to avoid this. The last mechanic of the fight, and probably the most punishing, is the Corrupted Geyser. You're going to notice that the water is going to pulse. After three pulsates, it's going to launch any players in the water into the air and deal a moderate amount of damage. Getting Wombo comboed by any two of these mechanics will most likely result in death. I wish you the best of luck on this fight. Once Wise Mari falls, your party will be granted the Blessing of the Water Speaker buff, which will grant you temporary movement speed for about 20 seconds. This allows you to actually get you and your group to move swiftly back towards the start of the dungeon and towards the Scroll Keeper Sanctum. In my personal routes, I would advise trying to skip past these first few mobs since they're extremely deadly. But since I'm sure a lot of groups will pull them, I will cover it. First, you'll notice a Haunting Shaw. These will cast Haunting Glaze, oh, <laughs> Haunting, Haunting Gaze, which will shield, deal, sh <laughs> fuck. These will cast Haunting Gaze, which will deal shadow damage to their target. Their more important cast will be Haunting Scream. I don't know if I should put this in. I'll probably edit this out. You'll only, <laughs> fuck. You'll only need one melee kick to cover this cast. If it happens to go off, you'll be feared for six seconds. Kick this at all costs. You'll also have to face off against a few of these mobs throughout the rest of the instance, so take note of their mechanic. Next, you'll run to the twins, Zhang and Zhang, Zhang, Zhang and Zhang. I think that's how you pronounce those. Whatever. These guys do pretty hefty physical damage to the tank from their aerialist kick. Their other ability is throw torch, though. As of right now, it's instant, and it applies a really nasty debuff to whoever is hit. And at least on beta testing, this happened a bunch, so if you're lucky, you can spell reflect it, but for the most part, the healer is pretty much on to spell duty for the rest of this pull. If you decide to pull these two brothers, I recommend trying to focus one down to get the debuffs to a manageable spot. The next mob you run into is the Talking Fish, who will be accompanied with some lesser shaws. The mob is playing a joke on Pokemon. It's gonna cast Splash, but nothing happens. Shout out to my boy Magikarp, right? Anyways, you're gonna want to pay attention to the Sleepy Soliloquy cast. 
This will put your tank to sleep if it gets off. It typically happens every 12 seconds, so you're going to want to have two people watching this kick to prevent this from happening. The lesser shahs don't do much, but when they die, they erupt dealing shadow damage to your party. Once they're low health, use a defensive or have a health potion ready to help your healer out. The next mob in this area is going to be the Songbird Queen. She will cast a nasty tank buster at the tank called Vicious Peck. This will apply a nasty bleed to the tank, and tanks, you should be very cautious about this dot. The Queen will also do a channel called Territorial Display, which will deal ramping damage to anyone inside of the circle. Just run out of this once it begins. Finally, the last three mobs here include the Crybaby Hosen, the Golden Beetle, and the Nodding Tiger. Starting with the Hosen, he will cast Tears of Pain, which is an avoidable AoE mechanic that spawns swirls. He will also enrage, resulting in more physical damage done. If you have a Soothe in your group, just remove this. The Nodding Tiger will leap to the furthest target, applying a bleed. I recommend trying to stay near melee to maximize cleave when this happens. Then the Tiger will also try to take a nap, which will heal the cat for 4% of its health every 0.5 seconds. Kick this or stun this whenever possible. Lastly, the Golden Beetle will slap your tank with a nasty 10% max health reduction through Staggering Blow. The Beetle will also cast Golden Barrier, which provides itself with a pretty sizable Absorb Shield, but once this breaks, it will deal damage to all players within 40 yards. Finally, once you're in the boss room, help defeat the scroll in order to spawn the boss. Back in the day, there used to actually be two different bosses in this room, but Blizzard did us a favor by making the fight consistent, so you'll always face off against Strife and Peril. Unlike Wise Mari, I'm not going to spend as much time covering this fight. The idea with this counter is pretty simple. Focus damage into one of the targets until he reaches 10 stacks, and then these stacks are actually gained when they take direct damage. Once the bosses go immune, swap to the other boss. Repeat this until your group successfully defeats these two cute fellas. Oh, and I should mention that with each stack the boss gains, they will deal 10% more damage. The nuance of this fight really comes down to managing the debuff of Feeling of Superiority. The longer you hold onto this buff, the more damage you'll take. The way to remove this debuff is actually by walking over another player, or at least coming into contact with one. Once you remove this debuff from yourself, you won't be able to pick up the debuff again for a short period of time. Ideally, you'll have your three DPS players managing this, since it's, after all, a damage buff. Due to the high amount of magic damage that the tank will be taking during this encounter, I highly advise to avoid letting your tank pick this up. This is definitely a tough fight despite the lack of mechanics. I wish you and your group the best of luck. Once you defeat the boss, just make your way up the stairs towards the east. You'll be met with two familiar foes, the Haunting and Lesser Shaws. Just a reminder, kick the fear and be careful of the eruptions when the Lesser Shaws die. Moving forward, you'll also run into two Shaw-touched foes, the Guardian and the Misweaver. The Guardian is more of a tank buster and will occasionally cast Leg Sweep which will stun anyone caught within it. The Misweaver on the other hand is the priority target. She will cast Defiling Mist which deals heavy magic damage to the target. You'll need a few players actually watching this cast. She will also cast Touch of Ruin, a nasty curse on a random party member, typically a healer or DPS. This can be removed with a Curse spell, or it can be removed through healing. Essentially, it's a healing absorption shield, so players afflicted by this should use a personal defensive or a health potion if they have it available. Once you make it to the courtyard, you're going to notice a variety of mobs that you've already faced, including Guardians, Mistweavers, Haunting Shaws, and Lesser Shaws. But you're also going to notice a new foe called the Minion of Doubt. These mobs are fairly easy to deal with. Their big hit will always slap the tank, and this ability is called Dark Claw. The minions will also cast Shattered Resolve, which is an avoidable swirl on the ground. In order to spawn the boss, you're going to need to clear the entire courtyard. How you do this is totally up to your group, though. I would advise clearing one pack at a time, but more confident groups can definitely double up some of these pulls with proper kicks and control. Lastly, there is a massive mini boss called the Shambling Infester smack dab in the middle of the room. This boss is a pretty insane frontal. This is aimed at a random group member though, so all players need to be paying attention. Alongside this, he will spawn little Shawlings. Similar to the lesser Shaws that we saw earlier, they will erupt upon death. Tanks, be sure to get threat as soon as they spawn, and players just be ready when they die to use a defensive. Blue Flameheart is an interesting encounter since it's the most dangerous right in the middle of the fight. She will start this fight by doing a tank buster on the tank and then sending out frontal waves in all directions. But once she hits around 70% health, phase 2 will begin, and I highly suggest using Hero or Lust here if you have it, and honestly, probably save your DPS cooldowns. Your tank will thank you. In phase 2, her frontal waves will actually now leave pools on the ground that will deal massive damage if you're caught in it. And her tank buster will also leave a pretty intense healing absorb on the tank. Tanks and healers alike should be ready to attempt to remove this shield as fast as possible. Almost every hit can be lethal. Once she hits 30% health, she will enter her last phase, summoning you Lawn. At this point, just be sure to dodge the frontal, which will always face the tank, and dodge swirls on the ground. On beta, these were really hard to see, but hopefully Blizzard fixes this before the season starts. 
Once Flameheart falls, you're ready to face off against the Shaw of Doubt. Before facing off against the last boss though, there is one pack you'll need to deal with, and contains three mobs we've already seen before, including a Mistweaver, a Guardian, and a Water Speaker. So the priority here is going to be kill the Mistweaver, then the Water Speaker, then the Guardian. Make sure you have one person watching the Tidal Burst cast from the Water Speaker, and then two people should be watching the Defiling Mist cast. If you decide to skip any trash at any point, you can actually find some extra mobs on the ramp leading to the backside of Wisemari's boss encounter to the north. This fight doesn't have much going on, but can be extremely lethal if played incorrectly. First off, I should mention that all players will randomly take damage from his Wither Will instant cast. Healers, just make sure you're spot healing these as needed. The main healer mechanic will come in the form of dispels. The Shop Doubt will randomly apply Touch of Nothingness to two party members. This debuff will do some serious damage and will also deal damage to any nearby player within the circle. Healers should dispel this immediately, and the other player will need some serious spot healing or damage reduction cooldown. About 30 seconds into the fight, and then roughly every minute, the boss will teleport to the center of the room and cast Bounds of Reality. This will shatter every player, which will spawn an ad that fixates the target. The best way to deal with this is just to stack up underneath the boss, and use cooldowns to melt them down. In higher keys, be sure to have a CC rotation because their melees really hurt. If any player or adds are still alive after 30 seconds, the Shah of Doubt will heal for a massive amount of health, so at the end of the day, this is really an ad control fight. Once the Shaw of Doubt falls, the Temple of the Jade Serpent will be cleansed of this corruption. I think I covered most of the basics. I honestly tried to keep this as short as I could. First off, it was really weird talking about all the different types of Shahs in this dungeon. Also, I typically end up just like ranting about every little optimization that you can make, but don't you worry though, throughout the season I do plan on making more video guides that are more in-depth with complicated strats in Mythic Plus, at least that's the hope. If you are looking for more content though, check me out on Twitch. While I don't necessarily have a stream schedule, I do stream fairly often, especially with the season right around the corner. Massive shout out to Owen, Ethan, and Mark, as well as all my other Patreon supporters, because without them there'd be much less of whatever you want to call this. I hope you're all staying happy, healthy, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Peace.